This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the x One and All. My name is Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. The capital of people who don't know what the hell they're doing, working for City Hall and cutting fiber optic lines. I can't believe I said that, but I'm just getting it off my chest. If you'd like to check us out online, www.exxoneradiotv.com is our website. All social media sites, x Radio TV, and of course, you can always send an email to studio at xzoneradiotv.com. Before we get to our guest this hour, Tony Urban, we're going to be asking you a very simple question, Exxon Nation. You know, simplicity runs wild here on Friday nights. How would you like to be part of UFO history? I will let you ponder that thought, but I would like you to go to www.cubesat4disclosure.com. Dot com. That's www.cubesat4disclosure.com. Make up your mind and you can participate at that website. Exonation, my guest this hour is Tony Urban, and we're going to be talking to Tony about his new book entitled West Virginia Travelogue of Strange and Spooky Locations. Um, he is a professional photographer, writer, and fan of general weirdness, both real and imagined. Tony has traveled tens of thousands of miles seeking out everything from haunted locations and UFO crash sites to monsters like Bigfoot and Sheep Squatch. No, that, I said see, uh, Sheep Squatch. We'll get into that in a second or two. In a previous life, he worked in the independent movie industry, but he finds his current career much more exciting. A Pennsylvania native, today's uh, work has been published in books and magazines around the world. He can frequently be found driving his Jeep around the countryside in search of his next great adventure with his dogs and his best friend, Sharon, at his side. And Tony, if you're looking for weirdness, strangeness, and stuff straight out of the imagination of horror movies, come to Hamilton and take a look at our at our uh, public works department. I'm sure that'll make another great scene for I'll somebody. I'll have that, that to the list, absolutely. <laughs> hey, listen, Tony, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you very much for coming in and joining us. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, when people think of West Virginia, uh, I kind of think of John Denver's song, West Virginia, Mountain Mama, Take Me Home, Country Roads. Uh, but I, I never knew that West Virginia was so rich uh, with the haunted, the weird, the bizarre, the spooky, the untouchables, the untalkables, and what in the name of God is a sheep squatch? I guess it's a West Virginia version of Bigfoot, basically. It's supposedly a, a mutant sheep monster that uh-huh. kind of stalks the Point Pleasant area, which is also home to where uh, the Mothman was from, actually. So there's lots of rumors about whether there were, you know, chemical weapons being mm-hmm. tested in that area that led to all of these creatures being created. Uh, it's a lot of, you know, paranoia and, you know, government nonsense, but... Yeah, Sheep Squatch is supposedly a seven-foot-tall sheep monster, which I never had the luxury of seeing myself, but I would absolutely love to see one. <laughs> Except it just might be the 
the fabrication or the creation of one horny Sasquatch and one horny sheep. Well, you know, there's lots of rumors about West Virginia, and I'm not going to uh-huh. go there, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, God, I love a man with a sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I know when I was reading your bio and I, sh- and I read Sheep Squatch, I was saying, what the hell is that? But anyway, okay, so what was it that, that prompted you to write your book? Actually, um, I had written a book about two years ago called mm-hmm. The Travelogue of Horror, which features, uh, for the most part, it's movie locations that were featured in horror movies, and then there's also some paranormal and some haunted information in there, too. But after that book came out, uh, my publisher, Schiffer Publishing yeah. in Ackland, Pennsylvania... They're a great bunch. I, they were a fantastic company, and they asked me to do a follow-up. Mm-hmm. And I, at the time, I really hadn't given any consideration. I was just kind of you know, still on the high of the first book coming out. And they said, hey, you know, write something else for us and pick a state this time. And I'm about an hour to an hour and a half away from certain points of West Virginia. So I said, well, let's just go with West Virginia. It's close by. It won't mm-hmm. involve a lot of traveling. At the time, I hadn't been to West Virginia a tremendous amount, so I didn't quite realize how expansive the state was. And I didn't realize that some areas of West Virginia were an hour and a half from my home. Some areas of West Virginia are about eight hours away from my home. Right. So we ended up putting about 10,000 miles on the Jeep during all of the travels for the book, and I think we made five huge road trips all together. All right, we've got to take a commercial break here, Tony. Um, Okay. Thanks very much for coming on. I'm looking forward to sharing the rest of the next hour with you. Exonation, our guest is Tony Urban, and uh, he has a book that is entitled West Virginia's Dark Tourism, and it's published by our good friends at Schiffer Books. Tony and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone, right from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com. Shamanism is recognized as a method to access the quantum level. Mastery of shamanic skills puts spiritual information and healing power into your hands. Path Home Shamanic Art School, a bonded Colorado certified occupational school, has met rigorous state standards ensuring its director and instructors have the qualifications to teach the shamanic arts. Path Home offers a certification program in blocks of study. Block 1, a five-day intensive, will be held in the beautiful mountain town of Coldale, Colorado, October 13th through 18th. Registration deadline is September 12th. 
Experience Journey Trance, Power Animals, Helping Spirits, Sacred Space, and Life Purpose. Come discover your power. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, in the magical world of shamanism. Call 303-775-3431 or visit findyourpathhome.com. Welcome back, everyone. Tony Urban is our special guest to this hour. We're going to be talking to Tony about his new book that has been published by our good friends at Schiffer Publishing, West Virginia's Dark Tourism. All right, take us on a little dark tour of West Virginia, my friend. I think my most uh, fascinating part of West Virginia to me is the variety that the state encompasses. Uh, if you're around the Washington, D.C. area, DC area it's very metropolitan. Mm-hmm. If you go into the southwest part, it is almost a wasteland. It is amazing how remote and how empty that part of the state is. And I'm from central, west central Pennsylvania, which is a pretty sparsely populated section of PA. Mm-hmm. But that section of West Virginia makes this look like New York City. And if you, I mean, it's kind of keep circling around. If you go up into the uh, the Wheeling area, it's very Rust Belt esque, which is similar to like the Pittsburgh area for me. But I think West Virginia just keeps drawing me back to it over and over again because there is such a plethora of different sightings of monsters and UFOs and various hauntings and just downright weird stuff like uh, George Washington's bathtub in West in uh, Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. So it really runs the gamut from just bizarre, amusing types of locations to things with some really gory, violent history to it that uh, for somebody like me who likes the darker side of tourism and traveling, it's unbelievably fascinating. So were you a skeptic or a believer at one time? And what was it that happened that changed you to the author that you are, the investigator that you are, and the world traveler that you are? I think I've always been a, a, a want-to-be believer, if that makes sense. I very rarely have ever had any experiences myself. Every time we go somewhere that has a fascinating backstory or the places you've seen on TV and, mm-hmm. you know, Ghost Hunters or on Ghost Asylum or those different TV shows, I'm always hoping to experience something. Uh, you know, nothing horribly violent, but I take anything at this point. So I'm going to say I'm, like, cautiously of a believer, uh, when it comes to the monsters, the Sasquatches, the sheep squatches, you know, obviously the logical part of my brain says there should be pictures that aren't, you know, blurry, that mm-hmm. all you can see is a little brown blur in the woods. But I feel like there's been so many sightings for things like that that there has to be something out there. And I think that's why I went to travel and kind of investigate things on my own. It just has always fascinated me. I grew up watching every horror movie imaginable. And I read Stephen King and R.L. Stein and Dean Koontz and Jack Ketchum. Uh, I mean, I grew up reading those guys from the time I was in fifth grade. So I've always been attracted to the darker side of life, I guess you want to say. You're, and you, I, go I, ahead, I, Rob. I, yeah, I was just going to say, you're a professional photographer. When you see these, guess, when you see these shaky images and all the pictures that, that are smeared around the world on the Internet who... These pictures make a lot of nonsense to a lot of people. Based on your experience and your expertise, you know, shouldn't these pictures be a lot more clear, a lot more better, a lot more convincing? I definitely think so. I think a lot of them are purposely blurry, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you, if you leave more to the imagination, I think it's kind of easier to pull off hoaxes, which I'm not knocking anybody that does a hoax. I think it would, if I could pull off a fantastic Bigfoot hoax that would, you know, make the rounds on the internet, I could probably, you know, die a happy man. I think really? that would whoa, be whoa, 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 whoa. Why would you want to do that? You're a nice guy. You're an honest citizen. You travel around the country with your girlfriend and your two dogs looking for the truth, and you just said on an internationally syndicated radio show that you would be happy to perpetrate a hoax. I definitely would be. If I can't take a picture of the real thing, if I could pull off a hoax, that would be like, you know, second, second to best thing on my bucket list, <laughs> Rob. <laughs> uh, can I come? Absolutely. Okay. If you want to put on the suit, you can play Bigfoot. <laughs> How did you know? I'm six foot five. I weigh 265 pounds. I'll be Bigfoot anytime. I was going to say, that sounds perfect then. We'll get the suit and I'll give you a call. <laughs> Oh, well, you don't need a suit. We can, do it. we can get on the West Virginia and do it. You know, my friend, you don't need a suit. All I'll do is not shave for three days, and voila, there we go. <laughs> there you go. 
video. <laughs> but you were telling me uh, that you're not uh, 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 that there's also a um, a connection between moth uh, Mothman and and the areas that you've looked at. Yeah, in um, like the town of Point Pleasant, yeah. West Virginia, it's right across the border in Ohio. It's kind of like right along the river there. Mm-hmm. There's an area in that town, they call it the TNT area, where I guess a lot of explosives were stored by the U.S. military. And th- that's where a lot of these rumors stem from, is that, you know, maybe it wasn't just explosives, maybe it was some type of, like, biological weapons mm-hmm. or nu- nuclear items that, uh, you know, leached into the ground and created these mutant monsters. I mean, obviously, you know, there's no proof of anything like that. But the TNT area is actually, cor- like, uh, I don't want to say quarantine, but you're not supposed to go there. It's all no trespassing because... I guess apparently things still just randomly explode. <laughs> You'd think they would just kind of clear it out and be done with it, but yeah. I guess there's a lot of, like, underground bunkers there that are still filled with explosives. And that's where, like, the very, I think it was the very first or maybe the second sighting of the Mothman was, was that an area where those teenagers were parked and they saw the Mothman flying overhead. And a lot of the sheep squatch reports are coming from that same area, too. Well, there could be a lot of explanations for that. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> good drugs, good booze, cheap booze, or boredom. Yeah, and I mean, when I say this, I'm not knocking West Virginia, but I could definitely see how all of those could come into play. It's <laughs> the same in my area in Pennsylvania. There's not a lot to do. So you get a couple kids out in the middle of the woods at yep. night, you know, ingesting some substances, and I could definitely see how their imagic- imagination could take hold. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it does not... It, in these days, my friend, it's not necessarily kids who are behind these hoaxes. For example, the last Bigfoot hoax that was found in a freezer was with Tom Biscardi, who at one time was looked upon by many people as the number one Sasquatch uh, researcher. Mm-hmm. You know, and then we've got everything that happened at Roswell, New Mexico. We've got, um, you know, and, and the list goes on and on and on. I've been doing the show for 25 years. Five nights a week, four guests a night. For 25 years and I'm still waiting for the smoking gun to be found and I mm-hmm. figure with all of today's modern technology we should be getting a lot better information than we're getting right now I yeah. know for a fact that the the number of photographs that are being submitted to all the different uh, sites like the Center for UFO reporting uh, the, I'm sorry what is it Craig the uh, the UFO Center for UFO reporting Peter Davenport and other organizations like that, the number of photographs of UFOs are substantially down because everybody realizes today with Photoshop, it's so easy to spoof a photo. Then mm-hmm. yesterday uh, on the internet, somebody put up a, a video of the UFOs over Haiti. And, you know, like, God, we debunked that in 2007, and here it is making the rounds again. Why do you think that there's this thirst, this lust, this this cry from the public for sensationalism? I mean, just being for myself, I guess I'm just always always wanting to see what else is out there. I think that's why I've always been so attracted to this type of thing. It's not that I, you know, am a complete believer, but I just I want to believe there's things out there that we don't know about, whether it's, you know, Bigfoot or whether it's mm-hmm. aliens or whether it's you know, werewolves, like there's a lot of there's werewolf r- reports in West Virginia. Um, it's it just, I, I, I want to believe, I guess I'm kind of like Fox Mulder in that aspect. You know, I just, I feel like there's other things out, it, I feel like life would be boring if we knew everything there was to know. So I just want to keep, you know, keep reaching out and keep mm-hmm. exploring and keep trying to find new things. And, you know, I don't have any, you know, actual hopes of being the person that discovers anything or gets that concrete proof. Mm-hmm but I'm not going to stop looking for it, that's for sure. (laughs) You know, and I admire that. I really do. When I speak to people who say, you know what, I have found this, I have found that, and you challenge them, they they really get upset. And they say, well, (laughs) why don't you believe? Well, give me something to believe, and I will. Yeah, I'm the same way. I would definitely, like I said, with the Bigfoot stuff, I mean, if you saw my Jeep, it's decked out in Bigfoot decals, and it's kind of like a a pseudo-celebrity in my hometown. But, uh, Everybody always says, do you believe in Bigfoot? Do you believe in Bigfoot? I want to. But, you know, the logical part of my brain knows that people have trail cams out everywhere. Exactly. There should have been a good picture by now. But I still keep hoping. (laughs) Well, now you can honestly say you spoke to Bigfoot in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And he does a radio show. There you go. Um, Why do you think that 
all these so-called ghost hunters, and I have to stop and just say a little bit about that word, ghost hunter. They're hunting something that's already dead. So that kind of puts them in a little category of their own. Why do you think that they keep going to the same spots, the, the haunted insane asylums, the haunted state prisons, the haunted graveyards? Like, don't, don't they think that if these ghosts were real and they had an intelligence of their own, they'd kind of take off by now? Oh, I definitely know what you mean, yeah. I, and I don't know why they keep going to the same places over and over. I don't know if it's just for the spectacle of it. You know, they're trying to go to places mm-hmm. and become tourist attractions afterwards, and they're kind of, you know, capitulating upon that. Um, I'd like to see more investigations into the houses that are supposedly haunted, you know, just general residences. Mm-hmm. And as far as, like, hauntings go, that's something I've always been very skeptical about. But about... Two months ago, I rented a cabin in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, and when I got there, it was a genuine 1860s old-fashioned log cabin. There had never been any, I had never known of any reports of hauntings or anything weird going on there. It was just a little weekend vacation to get away and write. And on the second night I was staying there, in the middle of the night, a vase fell off of an end table, crashed on the floor. And I have no logical explanation for what could have happened. I had the dogs with me, but they were both in their crates, so they weren't out dumping the table around. Mm-hmm. There were no little mini earthquakes or anything like that. So it made me wonder. It's the closest I've ever come to an actual experience of something that could possibly be paranormal. And I'm not saying it was, but... You're not ruling you know, it out. That part of my mind makes me yeah. want to believe it was, though. <laughs> but let me ask you, you've got two dogs. They were crated. Yeah. How did the dogs react just prior to the, the event? They were, they were both sleeping, actually. Mm. But uh, the one that we have, our older dog, Eli... After it happened, I noticed he sat there for probably, I'm going to say 20 to 30 minutes, and just kept staring at that one spot. I have no idea. You know, like I said, I don't know if he actually yeah. picked up on anything. But normally, you know, if we're in our own home and something falls or the TV makes a loud noise, he might look for a second and he lays back down and goes to sleep because he's an older dog. He's about nine years old. But this time he sat there, he sat up, and just kept staring and staring and staring for the longest time. So it definitely piqued my interest. <laughs> I saw I saw something really cute on Facebook the other day. There's a uh, a picture that is separated into four sections, and you've got two sleeping dogs, and it says burglar entering the house. Then you've got another picture of two sleeping dogs, burglar leaving the house. Another, the bottom left hand picture is some uh, I forget what it was, but somebody else was doing something wrong, and the dogs are sleeping. And the fourth one is the dogs wide awake, licking their chops, opening up cheeseburger. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that definitely sounds right. <laughs> so I, I also understand that you were actually at Charles Manson's childhood home, or his childhood hometown. Yes, we were. Uh, that was one of the locations I really wanted to find for the book, just to kind of see the area that he grew up in, mm-hmm. what you know could have possibly turned him into uh, you know this you know psychotic sociopathic cult leader, and it's just a typical Rust Belt West Virginia town. I don't know, you know, what drew him to, you know, become the way he did. But uh, it was, we found his elementary school where he went to uh, school, and there were a lot of reports that he had actually organized groups of bullies to kind of work for him at the school. And I, you know, in retrospect, you don't know if that's actually true, but it certainly does make you wonder if he was, you know, honing his skills back in elementary school. <laughs> it's, it certainly does. So, you and I have to take another break. Please stand by. Explanation: Tony Urban is our special guest. Tony, what's your website? My personal website is TonyUrbanAuthor.com. And Tony and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X Zone from our broadcast center, where Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I'm Rob McConnell. We'll be right back. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. 
call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7-365. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge, breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Explanation. Uh, Toby Tony Urban is our special guest, and uh, his website is www.tonyurbanauthor.com. And uh, Tony, first of all, thanks very much for joining us. Great having you with us. Um, we were talking about your new book that is out. It's entitled "West Virginia's Dark Tourism." It's published by our good friends at Schiffer Publishing. Tell us about your book and and why. This is your pitch, my friend. Let's be honest. You've got people around the world listening. They want to know about your book. And where they can buy it. Like Halloween is just around the corner. This is the scariest time of the year. Absolutely. <laughs> Basically, um, to me, the most appealing part of the book is that we don't focus on one particular subject. Uh, we don't focus entirely on UFO mm-hmm. sub UFO sightings or cryptozoology or you know true crime. It's just an amalgamation of everything put together. We go from really serious subjects like uh, the Charles Manson killings to uh, Mamie Thurman, who they called the Hillbilly Black Dahlia, who was murdered in the 1920s, to the Bigfoot sightings and the werewolf sightings and Mothman. And we also even have weird things, just like your kind of, you know, crazy offbeat tourist attractions, like 
a little town outside West Ber- of uh, Berkeley Springs where they have the type of giant statues that you used to see outside of restaurants and grocery mm-hmm. stores to uh, George Washington's bathtub in Berkeley Springs, which was supposedly built by George Washington back in the 1700s. And it's quite a tour. It's a major tourist attraction today. They actually still promote that in town. So I, I like to keep everything more on the irreverent side. So a lot of the subjects in the book carry my sense of humor through them. We don't take anything super, super seriously, which is probably for the best when you're talking about things like sheep squatches and, you know, giant black cats prowling the hills. <laughs> well, you know, like I said, I can understand, I can understand sheep squatch. You know, you get a horny big foot and a willing participant of a sheep and away you go. Um, there you go. <laughs> why, why, you know, like, how does Charles Manson fit into your book? Well, Charles Manson is actually in two different chapters. We went to his hometown of McMetchen, West Virginia. Yep. He was actually raised by his aunt and uncle for a short period of time while his mother was incarcerated. And his mother was incarcerated in Moundsville State Penitentiary, which is actually a place where Charles Manson spent some time himself. And in Moundsville, the prison's closed today, but they still give historical tours and they also give ghost tours. And they have a big section on the wall of Charles Manson memorabilia. Apparently, after he was convicted of the murders in California, he mm-hmm. wrote a letter to the warden at the West Virginia prison and said, let me be transferred back here. I always loved West Virginia. I'd like to live out the remainder of my days in your prison. But they turned him down, so he's still in California. <laughs> Jeez, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I'll tell you, they have this uh, photocopy of his original letter. Yeah. And one thing I learned is you do not have to have good spelling and grammar to be a cult leader. Well, you don't need to have very good penmanship to be a doctor, so there you go. Definitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if Charles Manson was in the same prison where his mom was, you know, Manson kind of took the family tradition one step up. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> But what, what's the fascination with George Washington's bathtub, my friend? Like, I don't know. For some reason, that's like the most bizarre, amusing location I visited. It's just in Berkeley Springs in West Virginia. It's they're famous for their um, like their warm springs or their hot baths. Oh, I see. They have yeah. Roman bathhouses and stuff there. And just as you're driving down like Main Street in Berkeley Springs, mm-hmm. in the middle of the park in the center of town, you have this big placard up that says George Washington's bathtub. And you walk over, and it's probably, well, it's about the size of a regular bathtub, probably about two by five feet. And it's just this little pool in the ground. And apparently George Washington and his friends were the ones that kind of started the uh, the healing waters and the warm baths in that area. And it just kind of exploded from there. And they have, uh, oh, they have like uh, water tasting competitions to this day. And that's what the whole town's famous for, so... The town was kind of built on George Washington taking a bath there. Uh huh. Okay. It's an odd claim to fame, but I guess whatever works. You've got that right. Uh, what is it? Location, 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 location. Absolutely. Uh, what about the uh, the hillbilly Black Dala? Uh, Dala, Dally. Yeah, the woman's name was Mamie Thurman, and back in the twenties, she was having an affair with a local businessman. Apparently, several local businessmen. And she was found, her body was found horribly beaten at the side of the road on uh, one of those crazy mountainous West Virginia highways. And she was shot and beaten and basically bludgeoned beyond, you know, really, really horribly. Uh, They brought her body back to town. They started going through all of her acquaintances. And it was a a really fascinating story because apparently the main banker that she was having an affair with Pretty much everybody suspected he had actually killed her, but they couldn't get enough evidence. And what they ended up doing was they convicted his manservant at the time of the murder. And that guy lived out the rest of his life in prison. And the banker apparently sent catered meals to him in prison. And you know, he got, in theory, got away with murder. All right. So. Let, me, let me ask you, the manservant, was he of the African-American persuasion? He was, yes. Oh, and from what I could find in my research, apparently he was also a dwarf. And I don't know if that's entirely true, but that's what all the reports said. So it's it's something out of like a David Lynch movie, basically. <laughs> it's either that or off of an old TV series where the little guy yells, De plane, de plane. Definitely. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, let me see here. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Yes. Tell me about that, my friend. That was one of the most interesting locations we visited, actually. 
it was uh, one of two insane asylums in West Virginia, mm-hmm. and it's been on all of those, you know, Ghost Hunters, Ghost Asylum, yep. uh, all of those types of show, Ghost Adventures. It's a sprawling building, and it's so crazy to just drive into this town and just kind of see this mental hospital just sitting right in the middle of everything. And it's a such beautiful architecture, like nothing you would ever anticipate finding in West Virginia or really anywhere on the East Coast. But uh, it was one of those like mental hospitals that you kind of hear the stories about, like where Geraldo Rivera went and found the patients huddled naked in corners, and you know, it was people were not treated well there. We'll just put it like that. But uh, they closed down, and now they've opened it back up for tours. And several years ago, they did a uh, like a haunted ride there. They call it the psychopath. And apparently a lot of people were very, very offended by that, which, you know, depending on your sense of humor, I can understand. But now it's a major tourist attraction there. And it's one place I would actually like to go to again, because when I was there, we only got to do the traditional tour. But I'd love to do the overnight ghost stay. And like I said, see if anything pops up at you. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, here we are in 2016. Why is the paranormal and ghost in your opinion, so popular. Like, come on, guys. Do you really believe that ghosts are real? And if you do, once we establish that they are real, what's next? I think it's just a fact. I think it's more of an escapism from real life than anything else. I think we've reached a point in time where technology has taken over so much of our lives that we want to see what's out there that we can't, you know, pin down. I think I think it's almost... If something is proven to be true, I think it's going to lose a lot of its luster. If somebody can actually prove that ghosts are real, or if somebody actually finds this Bigfoot body, I think a lot of people are going to lose interest in those subjects. I think it's more of the mystique and the mythology that kind of creates the hysteria around it than the actual, is it actually real or not? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got all these so-called reality TV shows where they go out, they're either looking for Bigfoot, they're either looking for ghosts, they're either looking for UFOs and extraterrestrials. What would you think that would happen if they, in fact, found one? You know, that's a good question, Rob. I really don't know. I mean, I think there would be, especially if it came to, like, UFOs, I think there would be mass hysteria. I think it would change a lot of people's belief systems, and probably not in a good way. Um, mm-hmm. I could definitely see kind of like a H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds thing going down, where a lot of people completely panicked and you know lost uh, lost their sanity over that. Let me I ask would, you, uh, you: You seem to see you, you. You appear to me to be a very sane, down to earth person. I hope I like to think I am. <laughs> No, no, no. You cut in a little bit too fast there. I'm singing you the role, sir. Um, Why do you think that so many people believe that the U.S. government and governments of the world are perpetrating a cover-up because, shh, UFOs and aliens, they really do exist? (laughs) I think it's just general paranoia about the government. I think, especially right now, I think people are extremely distrustful of the people in public office and of politicians in general. Mm-hmm. And I think it just I think UFOs just kind of feed into that. Um, and it doesn't even have to be UFOs that you have all the 911 conspiracies and you have even down to the really bizarre stuff like the school shooting conspiracies about mm-hmm. whether it's all, you know, hoaxes and yeah. actors. But I think as far as UFOs go, I think a lot of people maybe put a little more stock in believing that, that could be a cover up because if it was proven there is a other life out there. I think that the general, I'm not going to say most citizens, but a lot of citizens would then, you know, question religion and question the creationism. And would, you know, I'm not saying it would be mass chaos on the streets, but I think a lot of people would be uh, really, really scared and really terrified over that. So I can kind of understand why people within the government want to keep that secret, to kind of keep the public in order and to keep the peace and to keep people from completely freaking out. (laughs) But what would happen if the government is being honest and and there is nothing? I Honestly, I think that's probably the more logical explanation. Oh, hold on here, hold on here, hold on here. We cannot have logic on this show. Logic goes out the window. (laughs) No, but I'm just kidding. I I would appreciate hearing your your reply on this one. I I think, I mean, I personally would be disappointed, obviously, but uh, I do think that, you know, realistically, I think, 
the, my problem with conspiracy theories is the amount of people that would take to keep things covered up. Exactly. And I don't see how you could get, especially in this day of age with technology the way it is, I don't see how you could get hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands mm-hmm. of people out to keep a secret. And if things have been covered up, you know, in the 40s or 50s, when you had all the men in black stories, I feel like somebody would have leaked something out. Somebody would have written something down or somebody would have photocopied some photographs and their kids would find it in their archives. So I think realistically, there probably isn't any big giant conspiracy. And if that's true, you know, I'll be a little disappointed too. I won't lie about it, but you know, it is what it is. And we'll have to move on. We'll have to keep looking for sheep squatch, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only on the x could we actually bring together a horny uh, Bigfoot with a willing <laughs> sheep to get sheep squatch. Yep. <laughs> but I'm, but all seriousness here. I, 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 the only, you know, like I've, I've, I've looked at this from every angle. And you see, I don't believe it's the government who's committing the conspiracy to cover up UFOs. I don't believe it's the, the Vatican. I don't believe it's anybody except the UFO community. Because as long as the conspiracy is in place the ufo community does not have to provide any evidence to substantiate any of their claims oh very true definitely that's it just very true definitely no words oh, no, of wisdom no, I, mean, Come I, on. I definitely understand where you're coming from i mean <laughs> if you would start it definitely keeps people keeps people guessing keeps people on their toes if uh if it was proven that mm-hmm. you know there isn't anything out there uh, definitely a lot of people would lose their jobs. A lot of people would lose, you know, radio shows and podcasts. And people like me probably wouldn't be able to write as many books, too. <laughs> oh, you don't want that because you're a nice guy. I definitely. like you. Definitely. <laughs> no, no, we can't, we can't have that because, like I said, I like you. Uh, you and I have to take a commercial break, my friend. With We'll be back as we continue talking more with our guest of this hour. His name is Tony Urban. And Tony's website is, uh, let me see. Help me, Tony. Help me. Help me. It, help me. It's TonyUrbanAuthor.com. And we'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X Zone from our broadcast center where? In Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. As host of Dialogue with Divinity, I am thrilled to join the Exxon Broadcast Network and their growing number of affiliates. My quest for a connection to the divine ignited my successful career path as an international spiritual counselor for over 40 years, an author of four books, and well-known metaphysical educator. My clients call me their spiritual mama. So my job is to offer you a radio show to help you grow spiritually with wisdom and get specific tools from guests who are experts in their field. Tune in to Dialogue with Divinity and be part of the conversation with Spirit. My goal, your happy soul. For more information, please visit my website at johannacarroll.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Coming soon to the Exxon Broadcast Network is a different perspective with me, Kevin Randall, as your host. 
We'll be taking a close look at what is happening in the world of UFOs today with side trips into the paranormal. Guests will range from those who are household names to those who have a different perspective on a variety of topics. No topic will be taboo, but there will be tough questions asked as we all search for the truth about UFOs, the paranormal, and those things that excite us. Sometimes we'll agree with a guest and sometimes we won't, but we'll try to keep the program topical. For those of you who would like to read, be sure to visit www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and remember to listen to the other fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network at www.xzbn.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genex provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life is no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. And you're listening to my daddy, Rob McConnell, on the X-Zone Radio Show for the Talk Star Radio Network. You were a pumpkin. I was a pumpkin, a big orange pumpkin. A big orange pumpkin. And when you, were there a lot of children out there? Not so much. No? Did you get a lot of candy? Yeah, I got a lot of candy. Mommy's eating all the chocolate bars. Well, tell Mommy that's your candy, honey. Okay. Tell her. Exxon Nation, uh, Tony Urban is our special guest this hour. He's the author of West Virginia Dark Tourism. 
And uh, Tony, it's been great having you with us. This has been a great hour. Well, thank you, Rob. It's been great being part of the show. I really enjoy it. But listen, Tony, what is what is your final message? What wait, no, like why did you write the book? What are you hoping to accomplish? Um, are you a believer or are you a skeptic? I'm a cautious believer, and mm. for writing the book, my main goal was to make it easier for people like me to find these locations. Because for myself, when I first started going on these weird road trips, which was probably I'd say about nine or ten years ago. It was really hard to find addresses and find locations, and I could spend a day or two on the Internet just trying to find this particular spot, or I'd be doing the Google Street View and going you know, an inch at a time trying to find places along the road. So I wanted to include all the addresses, which I think is a big asset to anybody who reads the book and can go to West Virginia to visit it. We have street addresses for everything. But uh, personally, for me, it's being able to live out a dream. It's being able to see locations that I've read about online or stories that I've heard about over the years. And to see them in person, it's very surreal. I guess to me it's, you know, my version of Disneyland. And it probably sounds like a weird comparison to compare, you know, uh, finding, you know, the bunker at the Greenbrier Hotel sure. where they were trying to, you know, survive the Cold War to, uh, you know, Walt Disneyland. But to me, that's what it is. It's my personal enjoyment and my personal fascinations and the books allow me to go places I probably wouldn't be able to go otherwise because it gives me an excuse to do it and to share my little adventures with the world. <laughs> it sounds like more than little adventures. It sounds like a passion that you have. It definitely is. Yeah. Um, I, I would love nothing more than be able to just take a year or two off of my regular photography business and just travel and find all these locations and just see the country and see all the weird little places along the way because to me that's much more interesting than you know the biggest ball of twine mm -hmm. in minnesota or something like that i like to see the the that's why we call it dark tourism i guess the kind of like seedy underbelly that you know you hear about in whispers and you know hushed voices i love the urban legends that you know people kind of pass down through the generations and to me that's what uh, that's what i want to research so <laughs> all right listen. it's not a very noble goal i guess but it suits me we had a gentleman on the other night who was talking about the amusement parks and and how amusement parks are actually getting into the Halloween um, mood, I guess I could say. Mm -hmm. But I understand yeah. that, that you also have investigated a haunted amusement park. Yes, uh, Lake Shawnee Amusement Park in, I think it's around Princeton, West Virginia, if memory serves. It had been closed for decades and decades. Uh, there were a couple... Uh, people that were killed there and it had been rumored to be haunted over the years and it was very closed off to the public and it just opened back up i think about two years ago where they started allowing some tours and especially over halloween time they'll do uh, guided tours or self-guided tours and as soon as i heard about that it didn't matter that it was going to be a seven and a half hour drive i was completely there and there's not much of an amusement park left now i think there's about mm -hmm. two different rides but uh it's still it's super, super cool to see in person, to see all these, you know, rusty swings hanging there and seeing, you know, them swaying back and forth in the wind and seeing this murky pond and just wondering, you know, is there anything really there? Sharon saw a couple of little things. Um, she always has better luck with stuff like that than I do. She, I don't know, maybe they reach out to her more, but uh, it, it was a really, really cool location. And I don't know if it's open year-round, but I know it's definitely open around the Halloween season. Yeah, I think it's a real popular location, even for the remoteness of it. What about Teddy Roosevelt and his connection to the paranormal? <laughs> well, this is kind of up there with sheep scratch. Mm. But uh, there was a monster sighting in West Virginia, and it was called the Snallygaster. The what? Snallygaster? Kind of like an old German word, and it's this like flying, winged monster with like a horse head and kind of reminded me of the Jersey Devil. I don't know if you've ever heard of that yeah, legend sure. or not, but it kind of reminded me of that. But apparently the rumors, and again, when stuff gets passed down over a hundred and some years, you know, stories change, everything kind of, you know, takes on life of its own. But apparently the sightings were so numerous at one point in time mm -hmm. that after reading the newspaper reports, Teddy Roosevelt was going to go monster hunting. And I don't think it ever came to fruition, but that was the rumor, so... <laughs> So when we so, look yeah. at the, when, when we look at the big picture, you know, ghost hauntings, things that go bump in the night, Sasquatch or Sheep Squatch, um, Charles Manson, haunted asylums. 
Is, is there any one thing that we can look at and say, this is why it's real. This is why we should really pay attention to it. This is what makes it so ooh, scary. <laughs> to me, out of everything I visited in West Virginia for the book, the most convincing story when it came to you know, paranormal or otherworldly sense right. was the Flatwoods Monster. It would, took place in the town of Flatwoods, West Virginia. I think it was in the 50s or 60s. And supposedly there was a several different groups of people that saw like a fiery crash go through the trees. And they went to the site, site of the crash and saw what they described as kind of like a UFO. It was this, or not a UFO, well, a crash UFO and, a, and an alien. And there was like a tall green monster with glowing red eyes. And just for some reason, all their stories, it doesn't seem like a hoax to me. And I don't know yeah. why, out of everything I've read, because I know some of the places we feature in the book definitely sound like hoaxes, or definitely sound like just a concoction of bored minds. But for some reason, the Flatwoods Monster, that, in my gut, I feel like there was something more going on there. And I don't know, you know, mm. I have no physical proof of it, but if I took one thing in the book that I think would be more likely than not true, I think I'd go with that one. All right, let me ask you this very simple question. You're driving home with your girlfriend, Sharon. And you've got your two dogs in the back of the car. You're doing 60 in a 30. I had to add some stuff there. <laughs> and, and right in front of you is a UFO that is on the ground. You stop your vehicle. You get out. And you very cautiously go, go towards the UFO. What would be the question you'd ask to the to the extraterrestrials who are kind of looking at you in the middle of the road with your hand, with their hands on their hips, all 16 of them, <laughs> what would you do? I think, I'd, I think I'd want to know why, out of the entire universe, they wanted to come and visit Earth. Because <laughs> I don't know if we're really worth visiting, especially in the current climate. <laughs> oh, I love this guy. He's honest. Craig, we finally <laughs> found an honest guy. Took us 25 years, but here he is. His name is Tony Urban. <laughs> You know, Tony, I, I agree with you a lot because I am convinced that why NASA never shows you uh, what is on the backside of the moon is because there is a big neon sign that says, Earth ahead, go back. Earth ahead, <laughs> go back. Earth ahead, that could go be. back. <laughs> so what's next for Tony Urban? Tony, what are you going to be doing next? Uh, well, I'm actually writing another book for Schiffer. Um, it's called uh, Mid-Atlantic True Crime Travelogue, mm -hmm. which, as the title insinuates, it's all based on actual true crimes, and we're going to locations and researching them. And I actually have a zombie novel coming out next month called Hell on Earth, which um, that's listed on the website, too, for anybody that is in interested in the, uh, the fiction side of uh, my writing. Not that everything in uh, the travelogues is 100% genuine, either, but... Uh, that one's completely fiction. We'll just put it that way. But aside from that, uh, I have a photography studio, which keeps me busy about 70 hours a week. So all of my travel log and my writing stuff, that has to be squeezed in when I have uh, some spare time. But I love it. I love staying busy. I love researching this macabre side of life. <laughs> so, Tony, what are your final thoughts for the Exxon Nation around the world tonight? Well, I'd love to thank everybody that listened, and I want to definitely thank you, Rob, for having me. Oh, great pleasure, pleasure, my friend. Uh, as I mentioned to you privately, this was my very first radio interview, so uh, I hope I wasn't too boring. I hope I didn't say um and like too much, although I'm sure I did. But uh, I definitely hope people, if they have a chance to check out the book, enjoy it. Um, like, um, you did great, man. You were really, um, Tony, you were great. Well, perfect. You were really great. We'd love to have you back on again. Halloween is coming up soon. You know, when your Absolutely. new book is out, let us know. We'll get you back on. And uh, do me a favor, Tony. Never change because, man, the world needs people like you who have their feet on their ground and who could kind of look at this cockeyed world of ours and say, eh, what do I know? <laughs> well, I have no plans to change. So you no worries there, Rob. Tony, thanks so much. Quickly, give our listeners your website one more time. Okay, it's TonyUrbanAuthor.com. Tony, take care of yourself. My regards to Sharon, and uh, look forward to the next time you and I talk here in the Exxon.
I look forward to it, Rob. You have a great day. You too, my friend. Exo Nation, Tony Urban has been our guest. He is the author of a book that everyone must get for Christmas. Yeah, Christmas is what, two and a half months away? The book is West Virginia's Dark Tourism by our special guest this hour, Tony Urban. And I'd like to thank the good people at Schiffer Publishing for helping make this possible. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Thank you.